So if if they have now been able to regenerate that that ancient knowledge to where they can live a thousand years productively, then they can afford to take the long view. Let's say it takes a hundred years to totally transition from the population on the earth we have now to where it's down to where they are happy and the earth is returned to somewhat like the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Well, a hundred years, if you live a thousand years, is one-tenth of your lifespan. That's for a, a, a human being now. Uh, if you live 60, 70 years, that's like six years. <laughs> so even uh, so, even nuclear uh, radiation is, is no biggie here, or maybe they even have cleanup well, technologies remember, that we don't know about? Well, remember, the nuclear radiation can be ameliorated with this technology so it goes away in, in hours. How do I know that? Because some years ago on Good Morning America, some friends of mine demonstrated a pebble bed cold fusion technology that in 20 minutes reduced by half the radiation on live television uh, in, a, in a beaker uh, that, that has a half-life of four and a half billion years. Let me repeat that. Mm. Uranium breakdown takes four and a half billion years to get rid of half the uranium which is fissioning. They were able to demonstrate um, from cold fusion technologies on Good Morning America years ago on live television the ability to break down that nuclear waste in 20 minutes and not have to wait four and a half billion years for it to go way by half. So those technologies, again, could be used to ameliorate what's going on in Japan right now. They could have been used at Three Mile Island. They certainly could have been used at Chernobyl, and they were not. Because if we had access to those technologies, we get access to the whole ball of wax, as we say over here, and then we become their equals, and they cannot allow that. Ergo, we are being kept down on the farm in this transition until we can be moved aside for their plan for the future of their version of humanity. I mean, this is very scary and awesome stuff, and if I didn't have some good news at the end of this, I wouldn't even be talking like this. <laughs> What is, uh, what is some of the good news, uh, Richard? Well, the good news is that unbeknownst to them, the banksters quietly took their knowledge and, and developed in secret laboratories, black ops, weapons labs and whatever, equivalent technologies and physics, and that's why we're at war, because our guys, the guys that run us on Earth, the banksters, in fact, and you can call them the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds, you know, those cliched names, yeah. but they, in fact, are now at war with these guys out there, and that's why you're seeing, in our model, all the bizarre things going on around the planet, because we're in a secret war where none of the protagonists want the slaves, meaning all the rest of us, to know we're at war for the first time in history, we're in a war that we're not supposed to know about. And all we're hearing is like, it's like you're in the jungle in the middle of the night, right? And you're gathered around your little fire, and you're, you know, uh, roasting your, your, your roast pig over the, the, the spit or something, and you hear these big booms and thumping around in the darkness, and you have no idea what's out there. You just know that you don't want to get involved with it because it's a lot bigger than you are and probably a lot nastier, and you wouldn't come off very well. Well, the human race is like that. We're seeing all these weird things going on. They're being covered on the news as one thing when, in fact, they're merely the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the secret conflict, the secret competition going on between the guys who would be our masters and the guys who are their masters, and they're fighting it out, and we're not supposed to know, which is why there have been no horrific cities decimated or millions of people killed in one instant. The closest we came, I think, to that kind of awful horror was the earthquake in uh, Haiti, mm -hmm. which in an instant, you know, a few minutes, killed 200,000 people just days after the appearance of this incredible Norway spiral up over the northern climbs of Russia and Sweden and Finland, which was a signal just before President Obama was to receive his Nobel Prize that, in fact, he was to do their bidding and not what his own agenda might be, whatever that is. 
And I think we can see modern history reaching a major turning point on the morning of December 9th, 2009, when that spiral appeared over the northern pol polar regions of Norway and Sweden and Russia and Finland, and things dramatically changed after that. The uh, tsunami in, in Japan here, um, many people are speculating uh, now, obviously, as they always do after some kind of catastrophe, that there is uh, advanced technology involved. involved. Uh, HARP obviously always comes up in this one. Uh, I've been looking at the Sando, two X-class flares uh, very shortly before that. Right now, currently, as we speak, we have a so-called supermoon happening, uh, and we could even be looking at more earthquakes and other interesting events happening as well. Could Could it be that they are also utilizing certain natural energies because of uh, you know your know, solar flares and and, and uh, these incredible uh, proximities of, of uh, the moon to the earth or is it is it a technology altogether is is, is the heart uh, behind the tsunami in Japan do you think uh, richard well the honest answer is i don't know i'm looking at data it's very hard to come by but one of the things that really is intriguing to me is why the, the Japanese government, which is a very sophisticated government, I mean, Japan has been with us for hundreds, if not thousands of years in one form or another, right? And they live on an island which is constantly beset by earthquakes, right? Yeah. yeah. How could they have been caught so flat-footed, again, an expression we use over here, and be reacting in such a frankly, unprofessional manner. I don't understand um, it either. It's very strange. Unless they are encountering forces and indicators that are baffling to them, or they are under some kind of constraints that you will allow this catastrophe to unfold because it needs to make a major impression on decision makers and policy makers on this planet that if you don't do exactly what we say, we will eliminate you, we will destroy you, and this is our demonstration of our capability to do exactly what we say. Uh, there is a, an Israeli security firm actually in charge of the Japanese nuclear facility prior to the disaster, a year and a half ago before or something like that, they put in a, a safety system and things like that. I'm not saying that they are solely responsible for this, uh, but uh, you know, who, who, who do you think would allow, if anything, a, a disaster like this to to happen if that was it, if this was meant to happen in that sense, or again, are we looking at a uh, fluke kind of situation where where one thing just unfolded after the other? But just as you said, Richard, why wouldn't they be uh, prepared or have uh, better equipment uh, in, in place? It's a, it's an earthquake rich uh, you know country, a zone. Well, what, what's even more baffling is people say, "Oh, the Japanese are independent and reliant." Well, they're not. The Japanese are very dependent on each other, and they live on a very tiny island. They import 100% of their oil. They have no oil. 30% of their energy needs are met by nuclear power, but this is very old nuclear power. I mean, these plants were, were built by GE back in the 60s. They're like Mark I. They're the first generation yeah. of, of nuclear reactors that were deployed commercially on this planet. And the idea that they wouldn't, when they, when they, to even anticipate, given that they can look at the statistics just like we can and see the rising number of earthquakes. Have you looked at any, any USG charts over the last month or two at how many earthquakes, big earthquakes we've had in the Pacific mm -hmm. in the last uh, year? Mm -hmm. There's an extraordinary number. I mean, 6.0 earthquakes now are routine in the Pacific. It never used to be like that. So you have this rising background of nature. Remember, these are natural cycles. Under that cover of a natural background, you can hide all kinds of mischief and pass it off as just an accident due to the forces of nature. You know, that you can't, you can't box with God is, is another expression one could use. Hmm. But I'm finding the post-catastrophe reactions so bizarre because they don't match the people who I know have the expertise and the organizational talent to if they don't have, you know, necessary resources at home, they call on help. We live now in an international climate where when you have a disaster, the whole world pitches in and helps, right? Yeah. That has not happened in Japan. Why not? Yeah. I think it's because somebody's been told, don't do that. I, I, so, uh, look, I am grasping, like everyone else, at some kind of rational explanation for the irrational. Yeah. Why would you build a nuclear plant 
in an earthquake zone at the edge of the ocean on a on a on, on basically on the shore with a lousy 25 foot high wall to prevent a tsunami from sweeping you back into the ocean when you know you live in a a place for thousands of years that has had earthquakes, and if you look at the USGS data or your own geological scientific people, you can see that major earthquakes have been increasing for decades, monotonically, very predictably, and it's only a matter of time until a big one hits close to you and you have a huge tsunami roll ashore and do exactly what what was done. Yeah. This is not rocket science. This is not magic. This is so predictable, and yet they've done nothing. Have they done nothing to prevent it as they were told to do nothing? They, they've been uh, even making it worse because the Fukushima plant had actually kept over, I think, over 40 years of spent nuclear rods underneath the plant. So I think over, I think someone mentioned a number of about 600,000 spent fuel rods might potentially be, uh, you know, radiating out as we speak because, again, we c they barely can get close to these uh, damaged reactors. I think four in total now have been damaged. So we have no well, idea how much is get getting out there, Richard. What's interesting is we're not given accurate numbers. We don't have an accurate survey. We don't even have cutaway drawings of what the plant looks like. We don't have, you know, in, in independent readings of the radiation. We are we are literally living in a controlled disaster unfolding, and that's not even counting the horrors of the earthquake, which has killed untold thousands of people, and then the tsunami, which drowned those that managed to survive. I mean, this is this is a three uh, triple whammy. And it's not being responded to in the way that other disasters have been responded to in, in the past. And I think, again, this is nearly a speculation because I don't have hard data yet, but it fits to, to me the, the model that, yes, we're involved in a secret space war between humanity here on Earth and whoever our masters are out there who have evolved off Earth, as Dolan says, in the last 60 years into this stunning breakaway civilization, and we are being basically blackmailed into staying here and minding our P's and Q's and doing exactly what they say. And if anybody gets out of line, they can use this as an example of, see, this is what we will do to you, and it's only a tenth of thousands of what we can do, so you don't question. It's uh, it's very strange, again, just what you the, the point you bring up uh, about how Uh, either other, you know, the international community is prevented from from helping out here in, in Japan in one sense or another. I mean, look at how quickly they were uh, ready and and uh, willing to intervene in the internal affairs of Libya. Now that wasn't any problem, uh, but here in in Japan, where there is potentially the the entire population of you know the northern hemisphere is at at risk. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Well, I have heard numbers quoted something like seventeen hundred metric tons of radioactive rods, uh, you know, nuclear fuel rods that are stored in these ponds uh, waiting for when they can be transported to some kind of permanent storage off-site. And because these reactors were the first generation of nuclear reactors that General Electric built back in the 60s and 70s, they have to store those rods on-site in a swimming pool and they put them on the upper floors of the same buildings that are built around the reactors. Yeah. So if, if a catastrophe comes along and wipes out your reactor, it also wipes out your capabilities to keep those, those spent fuel rods cool, as we are seeing. I mean, this is like a perfectly scripted disaster, perfectly scripted. It's, it's awesome to watch. It's painful to watch. And the only ray of hope that I think I can offer is that I think our guys have some secret technology that they are now using to ameliorate it because by my calculations, we all should be living now under the same kind of disasters we had at Chernobyl. And the fact that we're not, the fact that even specialists are saying on network television, there are things going on here that we can't understand, it, it, it's not going the way we would think, tells me that maybe we are actually quietly using some secret technology to ameliorate the radioactivity because we are not going to go peacefully as our masters want us to. We are fighting back. Yeah. But no one is allowed to know that we're fighting back, which, of course, is what we're going to be discussing at the conference in detail in a couple of weeks in Amsterdam at this very important uh, secret space program conference. It's a very beautiful venue, very modern, very... Very, you know, it's got excellent audio visual. We're going to be presenting some pretty amazing images, 
And uh, I, I, I'm really thinking that this conference could become a watershed to where we coherently draw attention to the real problems of, of you know, as we approach 2012. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you obviously have been detailing uh, many, you know, fascinating aspects in terms of the extraterrestrial, in some cases, as far as we know, uh, you know, artifacts in, in our solar system, possibly beyond as well. In this particular situation, uh, when we have these different factions fighting a, a human, possibly then branch as well, that is uh, off-world already, out there in space. Are we alone in this situation? Do you, do you think that there's others out there, Richard, w watching and what is unfolding and happening here at the moment? 